Okay, thank you all for coming. Uh, this session is uh, identifying and supporting X compatible hardware blocks. And my name is Chen Yu. I'm a software engineer and sysadmin at Guadalosa in Taipei. Uh, my day job involves um, managing Linux servers, networking, and running tools to automate this stuff. And um, in my spare time, I've been working on embed Linux. Five years now, and I've been co maintainer of all weather SOC support in the Linux kernel uh, for two years and going. Uh, before I start, I am not an expert in this field, so if you have anything to add or if you have questions, feel free to interrupt me. Uh, so, um, This talk is, um, the motivation behind this talk is about sharing drivers. So, if you have hardware that is mostly compatible, then it makes sense to use one driver and then work around any quirks that each variant has. So, a sharing of driver means the driver as a whole gets more test coverage and you spend less time and less effort in porting the driver to your platform. Now, this talk mainly focuses on um, the experience we've seen as a uh, community for all winner support, and, but it should be general enough to like uh, apply to all other platforms. So first we'll talk about what do we mean about compatible, and then we'll talk about how do you identify the hardware blocks, and then how do you go about implementing um, driver support for variants for the glue layer around the, the, uh, the hardware. And then I'll give you some examples that we've seen over the past few years. So everyone should know about the duck test. If it looks like a duck, it swims like a duck, it quacks like a duck, then we call it a duck. Now, um, Applying this to hardware, if it has the same interface, if it has the same logic, and if it gives you the same responses or results, then it probably is compatible with something that you know. So if you've um, been using a personal computer in the late 80s or the 90s, you probably recognize some of these terms. Uh, VGA has been around since like forever. Warts, any 50 UARTs, any 2000 Ethernet adapters, uh, AdLib, and sound blaster sound cards. Um, these were like, uh, especially with the last two, these were like really popular products on the market, and so everyone ended up just being compatible with them, and this made like um, software writers, game developers very happy as they only had to su support like a couple of um, hardware variants and everyone could just use them. So, um, supporting, the com com uh, supporting these means that you have the low lowest denominator, you have like a basic function set which you can support and a common interface. And so one driver can apply to all the newer hardware, and it just makes life easy for us developers. Like, if you know um, most of the hardware is um, compatible with, suppose, a sound blast or sound card, then you probably only have to write a driver for that instead of like tens of, uh, or dozens of different vendor sound cards. Now, moving on to the modern uh, today, um, we see standard control interfaces, like for USB, for SATA, for SD cards, um, HCI, HCI, OHCI, etc. Well, yeah, but like, it doesn't appear that much anymore. And then um, we also see, um, in the embedded world, we see licensed IP cores. And for some of these cores, we actually see clones of them. Now, standard uh, interface means 
like there's a standard that defines what each register means, how you interact with them, what the hardware is supposed to uh, do, how should it respond, and each vendor will just implement the standard, and you should be able to just use a common driver for it. Now, of course, when uh, the vendor integrates it into the SOC, there will be uh, a vendor glue layer. The vendor has to provide clock signals, reset controls, other control signals, and probably apply for it. But um, as we'll later sh uh, show, this, will, this can be handled outside of the core library, uh, the core driver. And moving on to IP vendors. Um, in the embedded world, you've probably seen at least one of them. Uh, Synopsis, as in the uh, design world, product line, mentor graphics, cadence. Uh, these vendors provide um, IP blocks for various peripherals such as USB, HDMI, Ethernet, and. Sorry? I thought I also wanted to give it an idea. I did. Oh, okay. Um, and um, SOC vendors can license these individual cores and integrate them into a sound. So you typically at least see one or two of these. Um, the licensed IP cores only include the core logic parts. So. Um, you might even see licensed IP cores for the standard hosting control devices we um, just mentioned. And again, the uh, SOC vendor has to implement a glue layer for clock signals, resets, control signals, anything platform specific. And most of the time, there's also a fight uh, involved in this. And we've also seen clones. Um, well, it's possible it's a clone, or maybe it's just a, a variant of the licensed IP. It has the same logic. Sometimes it's missing registers, and sometimes the registers are just moved around. Might be a, just a implementation detail, or it might be done on purpose for obfuscation or something. Like some vendors really don't want people knowing what IP blocks they're using. So how do we know like um, what hardware block or what IP core your stock is using? Now to do this, uh, you really need some resources, um, data sheets from your vendor, possibly your vendor VSPs. Uh, if you have any contacts your vendor, if you're uh, in a good relationship with them, you might ask them. Sometimes they will respond. Most of the time they won't. And also the larger kernel community might be able to help you. Um, besides your platform's data sheets and VSPs, there are some good public data, uh, data sheets that you can compare to. Like, um, the IMX6 reference manuals. Um, this has very detailed uh, information on a couple of designware controllers. The HDMI, HDMI5, and uh, Ethernet controllers are all listed, and it's very complete. Also, the TI Keystone 2 user guide library and the Zcom for scale. Um, we use them in the community for identifying the uh, DRAM controller in the AADS stock. Um, for identifiers, um, typically if you get a data sheet, you can look at register layouts or register names. Sometimes you will be able to map them one to one to a known uh, example. Um, if your artwork has a DMA engine embedded inside, um, the DMA log logic might be specific to this kind of uh, to this controller, or the descriptor format might be uh, specific to this controller. And also, there's a last option or a last resort. If you have a VSP, and it doesn't have to have source, if it's just a blob with symbols in them, you can like 
dig through the symbol names and find some of the more peculiar ones and just pull them. Sometimes you get a hit with some weak source. It's probably not that um, usable in the in a code sense, but it gives you an idea like what this might be. And last, this really requires a lot of experience in the field and a lot of luck. Um, if you have a new sock and it says nothing about like the vendor, uh, the, the capabilities, or possible model of the controller, then you are really, you really have to look at everything and you really can't, it's not possible for you to know everything. So you can only identify something, you can only re recognize something that you've seen before. And if you actually do manage to do this, then it's best that you can leave notes for others to follow. Um, also, experienced members in the community might be able to help with this. Uh, we've seen um, Arn and other people come by and just look at this hardware, look at this data sheet, and says, oh, this might be Winter Graphics at USB. <laughs> and there's also like a good possibility that you can't identify it, and then you start writing a driver for it. And then you, you finish your driver and you post it on the mailing list. And then someone comes by and says, oh, OK, this DMA structure looks a lot like uh, signware. And then you throw out your driver and you start porting the existing one. So your, your mileage may vary. Now, now that you've um, identified your, your hardware, you will start to um, port or implement your platform specific glue layer for the existing drivers. Now we, in the kernel there are a few um, ways to go about this. One is for very common hardware control blocks. They will typically have a driver library. library. The core logic is implemented as a library and then we have different platform drivers implementing platform specific stuff for each platform. So there might be extra resources, blocks, reset controls, or regulators involved. There might be a few extra registers that need to be poked. And then um, typically the platform driver will implement some callbacks and pass on the uh, callbacks and the config to the uh, library. So this is an example. This is uh, the uh, DW Mac Design Word Mac in the kernel. It's called STMAC for some reason, and it's a driver library. So it also has common functions to handle some common resources and parse some common uh, config options. And then you implement a few callbacks and pass it on to the library. Hmm. Now if the, uh, the core driver is not um, a library, it's just um, an old driver and you are porting it to something else, then um, we typically just match um, by the uh, bus ID, such as a platform ID, I2C, S2C ID, or device tree compatible, and um, you will writing code, what the differences are between all these various that the driver is supposed to uh, support. Um, some drivers just check if the ID will something and then it will do X, Y, Z. Um, unfortunately, it, it kind of works, but it's kind of ugly. And if you start supporting more than a few uh, variants, the list kind of grows a bit. And it will be hard to maintain. So. Um, the preferred way would be to have a data structure with uh, various fields that say um, there's this feature, that feature, ABC, and then the, the driver code would just check all these flags. And if it has a feature, it will do this. If it doesn't have a feature, it will do that. 
And in some cases, you have to deal with register changes. Um, some hardware we see, we've seen uh, has register office offsets that have been changed, or even bit fields that have been moved around. Um, we have a couple of ways to deal with this. Uh, first one, if it's just register office offsets being moved around, you can just use a register offset table. It's basically a data structure with listing all the, uh, the offsets that you care about. And instead of using a uh, defined macro to uh, access, you use the, uh, the, the offset from the table. Now, if you have something more complicated, like bit field changes, or um, you want something that's cleaner, you can use regimat uh, math fields. <coughs> A register map field defines the offset of the register in the register map, and the bit field parameters like shift, the, the bit fields shift and width, and it handles these uh, the bit masks and shifts for you, so <laughs> you don't have to all have, have the uh, left shift or right shift in your code anymore. So first, it, you define your, your reg register fields, and then you instantiate them, and then you just use the, uh, the instantiated rich Bridgman fields to do your access. And last, um, there are some cases where you're, you can't use these. Um, sometimes you have missing registers that you have to provide um, same defaults. So, the last resort would be to provide custom I.O. functions. So any I.O. that the driver does goes through these callbacks. And this is common, uh, this is found in the uh, USB driver um, where we have um, register offsets that have been moved around and uh, the all winner version is also missing a couple. Um, so, any questions so far? Okay, so we'll go through, go through some examples. First of all, uh, the 8250 UARTs. Um, it's kind of like a de facto standard, and the kernel has uh, a 8250 driver library. And if your UART has nothing special, just use it. If it does, then it wraps around it. So on uh, all winner socks, we have the uh, synopsis designware UART, which has an extra interrupt signal. And basically it fires if you try to change any settings while the UART is busy. And what you get is, uh, is a rapid fire interrupt that no one cares about, and the kernel would, would complain and then it would shut down the IRQ the interrupt, and then your UART will basically be kind of unusable. And so the 8250 DW driver basically uses the 8250 library, but it provides a custom interrupt handler to handle this. And I think it's like uh, 50 to 100 lines of code. Um, HCI. Sorry? So, uh, one question on that. So, uh, what happens with that in terms of if it's uh, somehow supported knowing that the uh, design where in the driver room or what? You just noticed that and uh, you did nothing about that? Um, okay. So, the question was is this extra interrupt supported in the uh, design where driver? Yes, it is supported. Um, when we, uh, the communities first started doing all winner support, we use the stand, standard 8250 UARTs. So you would, in some cases, you would get this problem. And so uh, Maxime, the, the other retainer, would found out about this and then he just switched over to the uh, designware driver and everything is fixed. So HCI. Um, HCI has like two libraries. The HCI handles the core stuff for the uh, Sava controller, 
And then with HCI platform handles the uh, extra platform resources like clocks, uh, regulators, files. And then there's a generic HCI platform driver, which is basically just a wrapper with the uh, driver module boilerplate around the uh, HCI platform. And some platforms, such as AllWinner, implement a platform-specific version of HCI drivers. Um, <coughs> Uh, they, ours has to poke a few extra registers for DMA to work. And different platforms have different reports. Okay, uh, next up, USB. So for OHCI, EHCI, and XHCI, I'm not sure about UHCI, but um, these three have like um, driver libraries for them. The, HCI-HCD um, driver library, and these handle all the USB parts of the, uh, the interface. And then there's also a generic platform driver which handles all the common files, clocks, and regulators, and in some cases, uh, there's a platform-specific version for this. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. So, so yeah, it's been. Um, USGI also has a platform driver. Uh, Mentor graphics and USB. So this is a uh, USB on the go controller. It can do US, do uh, USB host mode or gadget mode, and it's seen on something like five platforms. And it has all the uh, required control signals for OTG, um, ID pin, and Webus detection. And there's like a driver library for this. And it, it also, it, at integration time, it requires a separate USB file. Now, the uh, all winner version has rearranged registers and also has missing registers. So we support this with. Uh, custom I.O. functions, and for the uh, register that is missing, we just provide the same value. Unfortunately, the uh, missing register is actually the uh, feature register, so that's kind of, kind of bad. And um, the all winner socks have a very uh, weird USB file interface, so programming them requires um, bit poking. A register and basically it's kind of like an embedded, embedded bus within the, the sock and you have to use a very weird sequence to access them. And also the uh, ID and V bus detec detection lines that I just mentioned are not routed outside of the sock. So in this case we have to use extra GPL lines to do this and then somehow export the status to the end USB driver, which we do using the EXTCON framework. <coughs> um, last two are design work examples. The first one is a design work map, and um, it has many hardware re revisions. The later ones have a feature register, which is nice, but ours doesn't. Um, it's found on a dozen or more platforms, and it's called STMAC in the kernel. Um, I believe this is because um, ST Electronics was the first platform to implement this. And it's a driver library, and the, the platform is supposed to provide the fix uh, features and various callbacks to the, uh, the, the library. Now, the old version we've seen in all Render stocks is a very old revision. And it doesn't have the uh, feature register I just mentioned. So I had to like dig out all features supported by this hardware from the BSP kernel and then put them into the driver. And then there's also a glue layer around this and it's pretty standard stuff for uh, Ethernet controllers. I think all platforms have the same design. It's just a different way of accessing them. It's normally it's just on register. And later, um, all winter socks had this weird um, EMAC, and it was a DW Mac with rearranged registers. 
and some of the uh, bit fields have different meanings for the various values. Yes? Uh, so do you know that actually there are two different libraries on that controller, so one is older uh, STM Mac and newer QoS, so probably uh, they use just a newer uh, Ethernet controller, can you check that? I'm sorry, um, you, you're mentioning the uh, QoS driver? Yeah, so could that be the one here? Um, I'm not sure actually, so I'm not the one that did this work. I'm, I'm, this is basically a compilation of stuff that we've done. And um, yeah, that might be worth checking out. So um, this controller only supports chain DMA. The old controller supports both ring mode and chain mode. It's basically uh, the difference is how you allocate DMA descriptors. And the DMA descriptor is, looks the same. A few, mark, a few fields are marked as reserved. Now at the beginning, uh, the guy who was doing support for this uh, did not realize that this was a DWMAC controller. So he wrote a full driver from scratch and posted it on the mailing list and he got to like um, version 5, I think. And then um, someone came in and said, oh, okay, this is um, basically a DW Mac controller. And then it only supports chain mode, and but the DMA descriptor looks the same. So he basically threw all that work out. And I think it took him like six months or so. So now there is a new version of the driver that's an extension of the existing STM Mac driver, and I think we're now at version 9 or version 10, maybe. There are some hiccups with the uh, device tree bindings. But yeah, you really want to avoid these types of conditions, like when you put in all the work and then it gets thrown out. Uh, last, uh, designware HDMI controllers. Um, this is found on five or six platforms, I believe. Um, half of them use the uh, standard designware HDMI <coughs> and half of them use a custom file. Um, there's a DW HDMI driver in the kernel, and it's sort of a, li a library, not quite. Um, it provides probe and bind functions if you're familiar with the uh, DRM subsystem. Some, some drivers use the uh, component framework and some just use the standard driver model. So when I say library-ish, I mean uh, the, the, uh, the library actually pokes with driver-specific data in that it does plat, uh, plat drive set uh, set drive data, so you can't really have your own private data when you're using this. Someone might go and clean it up, I'm not sure. And again, the platform provides some config options and also callbacks. In the case of custom files, it provides um, callbacks to set up the file. In the case of HDMI uh, design where HDMI files, it provides a table for the settings. And um, on AllWinner, the uh, HDMI controller is obfuscated. Um, basically, the uh, 32 address lines are scrambled. So you get really weird um, addresses. And fortunately, someone found out how to uh, disable this. And so you write magic numbers to some red, uh, random register, and this gets turned off. And you can just use the uh, standard a design work driver, and it has a custom file, and unfortunately there's no source code for this, so uh, the file settings are limited to whatever we could uh, reverse engineer from the uh, BSP kernels. And so to recap, we uh, as a community would really like to avoid duplicate drivers, um, but identifying hardware is really hard, and in 
in cases where you will have direct contact with vendor, it would be really good to ask the vendor, but um, all vendor does not talk to the community at large. I know some people might have um, personal contacts, but as a company, they really don't talk to the community, so it's kind of hard for us to do this. And last, um, it would really help uh, others to, if everyone doing this could share their experiences, how they do it, um, what, what identifiers they're, they're using, how they got their info, um, just put in the commit log, uh, put in a wiki, make a blog post, do a presentation. It, it really helps to like put this uh, information out there on the web so others can benefit, benefit from, from it. And that's all for today. Thank you. Any questions? One experience on the Olin platform, and it's, it's even the Olin or A20. And as you said, there are some uh, paper data sheets actually miss some uh, registers. And I guess all the Olin platforms, or most of them, would be able to do dual name, which for the A20 uh, was described in the features list, but nowhere in the user manual or anywhere at all. So uh, just putting different data sheets from the A13 or the A10 or the A33. At least one of them suddenly had this uh, description or a prejudice set, which also worked for the A20 as well. So that, that also helps looking at different things on the same family. You mentioned people should share their experiences from the frameworks, and we've, we've kind of encountered many of those situations in the past, like in frameworks and all those sort of things. So the question is whether there shouldn't be some kind of central, you know, uh, wiki that people should just kind of gather around. So it gives you encourage people to do blog notes and so on, but then this information is still kind of very dispersed, and you know, everyone's kind of finding out different things, and perhaps some of the findings are not precise, because some people have assumed something that are not correct. So what if it was an actual week, we could just kind of have list of all the SOCs people are trying to do different values for, and what parts these SOCs have, and what corresponds to what. It, like, you could have it in tablet form and so on, it shouldn't be extremely hard to do, it's more someone would have to actually kind of make sure that the information is relevant. Um, so I believe we have this for all their socks, but yeah, kind of getting them from all the different vendors is um, kind, of a, kind of a large workload. I do believe there is a website that has um, a list of all I2C controllers, and it also lists like who is using them. But so, on the other side, so like socks and what they're using mm -hmm. is like I square C and who's using that I square C basically. That could be kind of interesting. Yeah, so the, the comment was um, having a, a tabular format for cross referencing would be nice. Yeah. Uh, any other questions? <laughs> First of all, thanks, thanks for sharing as well. Um, I'm just wondering, can anyone else comment on what other vendors are similar or different to Allware? Is Allware typical? Typical as in not engaging the community, you know, making it very difficult. <laughs> <laughs> um, on engaging with the community, um, I'm not sure actually. Um, like Rockchip was kind of kicked into doing this, and um, and Logic has contracts with um, with Bailey to do mainline stuff, and um, I think some of the uh, Chinese vendors are still kind of locked up, and even MediaTek is only doing mainline work and releasing data sheets for a small subset of all the chips, so it's, yeah, I think it's um, kind of a, maybe a culture issue. Um, any other questions? 
Um, I think we're about out of time. So thank you everyone for coming.